All right, everyone, welcome to our noon book review. Today is not really a review. Jay's going to talk about his own book, The Long Fault. Um, when I interviewed Jay a couple years, or last year or two years ago, I, I said to him, um, there's a lot of poetry around. We see it, you know, there's in books, and Garrison Keillor every morning reads the poem and all that. And I said, well, what, what should we do when we see a poem? And Jay goes, run. So <laughs> I hope you're not going to run. Jay's going to talk about his book, read some of his poems, and you're going to really like him. So here he is. Hi, <laughs> uh, thanks for coming out. It's, it's much too beautiful a day to be inside listening to somebody talking about poetry. So, so I appreciate your being here. Uh, I'm Jay Rogoff. I have uh, just published a new book of poems. It's my third. And this is a book called The Long Fault, uh, just out from Lu Louisiana State University Press. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it and then talk about, then read some of the poems from it and uh, you know, perhaps about you know, 10 or so poems and, and talk a little bit about where some of those poems came from. And uh, perhaps we'll take about 30, 35 minutes doing that and, and uh, then I hope we'll have plenty of time for, for questions. And if what you hear at all interests you, I also have some, some copies for sale. It, the Long Fault is a book that came together from uh, three different directions, uh, three obsessions of mine that I hope harmonize well in this book. Uh, so I'll talk about each of those a little bit. Uh, one of those obsessions uh, that's come more and more into my work of late is uh, history. How historical events, uh, incidents of mass violence, uh, past and present wars have left scars on our individual psyches and also on our species and uh, helped us understand a little bit uh, some of the worst that human beings are capable of. And by history, I'm, I'm using that term very loosely because many of the poems also include, also deal with myth. Uh, there are poems uh, that deal with biblical events. There are poems uh, from Greek legend, medieval legends, and Mexican legends, and so forth. Uh, Another direction that the book is coming from is that of the arts. I write a lot of poems that have to do with uh, other works of art, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that I'm married to an art historian, so we uh, travel a lot. Um, somebody's got to do it. And, uh, and I'm often going along with her to, uh, to various places in Europe as a, a kind of unofficial research assistant. And she's, uh, being with her has taught me to, to look at art very closely and uh, find things in it that are, uh, that are useful and, and fruitful for my own work. And uh, it, it's a process that's called uh, ekphrasis. Uh, ekphrastic uh, writing is writing that is about other works of art, specifically visual, but uh, but the book also examines, in addition to painting and sculpture, also deals with other works of literature. There are several uh, poems uh, that are homages to other writers. Uh, photography is a big interest in the book. Uh, music, architecture, and, and other arts. Uh, and sometimes I combine some of these in the same poem. So what I want to do through those is, is to try to have us understand how works of the imagination can help us uh, understand the, the flip side of the history equation, uh, some of the best things that human beings are capable of as opposed to some of the worst. Uh, the third element that I bring to these poems is, uh, is personal experience and individual imagination. In some ways, the, the book is a little less personal for, than uh, than earlier work of mine, which dealt with uh, my family and, uh, and my first marriage. And, uh, uh, but in some ways, it's more personal because uh, all of these elements that I bring together are very much part of my own imaginative uh, makeup. So I'm interested in how imaginative amazement can arise out of events that we witness in everyday life, uh, and also how historical events and works of art can come together in the mind to form a complex of feeling that uh, might not give us any answers, but perhaps offers us some imaginative strength to, to continue with, with what we're doing. And as I continue to proceed into middle age, uh, I find myself meditating more and more as, on uh, our mortal condition, the fact that we're not going to be around forever. And uh, many poems in the book address that real fact not always in morbid ways. Uh, I hope that a lot of the poems in the book uh, 
marshal a, a kind of peculiar humor, I hope. Uh, so, so these three strands, the, uh, the historical, the aesthetic, the arts, uh, and the, the personal, are intertwining through many of the poems that are, that are in this book, The Long Fault. And also binding it together is my continuing interest in poetic form. Uh, most of the poems in this book use some kind of uh, form or meter. Uh, you'll often hear uh, in, in these poems, or may, maybe, yeah, you'll often hear uh, some rhyming. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of rhyme. Uh, but often the form is not necessarily audible. Often it's uh, almost a kind of uh, device for me to get the poem on the page, uh, the way the way a painter begins with uh, a particular size canvas and knows that that has to contain the work. You know, I will think of uh, a sapphic stanza or a sonnet as being the container for the work and, and that is going to help me uh, shape the material and, and, and put it on there on the page. It, it actually in some ways makes the job easier, although wrestling with form can be one of these uh, Jacob and the angel uh, acts. Um, but, but as I say, often the form is not audible, and, and that's fine, too, when the art is, is a little more hidden. Uh, the book is divided into three sections, and in each section, uh, all of these elements, I hope, are present. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the title of each section. The first section is called In Time, and they're poems that often, uh, don't, they don't always, but they're, they often address the present as well as uh, ideas of impending disaster, the idea of saving ourselves in time, uh, having enough time. Uh, the second section is called In Camera, and that was originally going to be the title of a book that, that dealt with my interest in photography and uh, in, in two different ways. Uh, especially uh, one, early prehistoric photography, daguerreotypes and uh, uh, some of the uh, photographic experiments of, uh, of uh, photographers like William Fox Talbot, the early English photographer. Uh, but also um, there is a snapshot to which I devote several poems uh, from my own prehistory. Uh, it's a snapshot of uh, my wife that was taken of her when she was 15 years old, uh, b long before I knew her. Uh, so, in this section, I'm also playing with the idea of the photograph, the photographic idea of camera, as in darkroom, uh, where things develop, and also a more in intimate sense of camera as a chamber, as a dark room, in which things develop. Okay. Uh, the, the final section is called inevitable, and that rounds off the idea of our mortality and, and it uses history, art, and uh, our experience to meditate on, on what we can salvage for human purposes. And, and I realize I'm making this all sound very grim and, 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 and <laughs> you know, if you ride along with me, I hope it'll be a little more fun than that. So what I'd like to do is to read several of the poems and for each of them, I'll talk a little bit about where the poem came from and, and how I see it uh, fitting into the book. And then uh, I'll be happy to, to you know, take questions afterwards if, if you have any or if, uh, or if you want to request any poems to read, all right? Uh, the book opens with uh, going back to biblical history and uh, it's a poem called uh, Cain's Gift and uh, it of course goes back to the Cain and Abel story uh, and the specific image that I, that, uh, that I discuss here, uh, which is, is only alluded to, well, the image is described, but, but its source is only alluded to very briefly. This was a relief sculpture of, uh, of, of Cain and Abel uh, in the chapter house at Salisbury Cathedral. That's, that's almost unnecessary for the poem, but I do mention Salisbury in it, so. Cain's gift. The blood cried up from the ground and the air held its breath. The earth's sunset-stained face, now an epitaph for Abel's head and hands, thrust up from the grave. That childish face profiled, those hands clasped, a child imagined by the sculptor petitioning the god who'd let the model murder play out unimpeded. From brother to his keeper, the singing from the sod rose, a sunset lark whose quavers left their mark on Cain's consciousness setting him a quiver at walking the cooling face of earth, banished forever from Salisbury's chapter house, a period 
put to his chapter, and from the good book hurled out to beget the world. That's kind of how I see the world these days, that, uh, that we are all <laughs> we're all the descendants of Cain, right? Yeah, all right. Um, This poem will lighten things up a little bit. Uh, there, are, there are sometimes things that happen in your personal experience that you know are going to become a poem just because of the, the extraordinary nature of, of what occurs. There, uh, many poets write about daily life, and I do also, uh, but, but every once in a while, something so, so strange happens that, that you know you, you have to write about it. And, and so I take, I take the event that, that precipitated the poem, and then I, then I kind of run with it. Anyway, this is, this is a poem called The Guy Who Passed Me Doing 90 Miles Per Hour and Playing the Trumpet. Right. Um, th this is an example of a form that is, that's going to be kind of buried. You're not going to recognize that this is a form at all, but it's actually in an ancient Greek meter uh, called Alcaics, for what it's worth. <laughs> Left hand in charge of steering, his right on his valves, lips compressed, Geez, how could his embouchure hold firm in throughway traffic? Why this lunatic didn't create fresh carnage beats me. The speeding jerks on their yammering cell phones lead sainted lives by comparison. I love that blessed solitude while driving, that heavenly, insulated half hour or so, so quiet except for my car wheels revolving, turning the world underfoot. Cool and modern? Hot, baroque, or classical? Armstrong, or Miles, or Purcell. So what? Or Copeland's fanfare. Or taps for those cut down like grain as Gabriel harvests his highway. Yes, taps for everybody jamming the planet, those half a dozen more horn men blowing up the proverbial storm, burning ancient charts in a riff like an x-ray whose tonic revelation rouses the dead to the flame of sunrise. Well, so there's a, there's a poem that begins with the event. It uh, brings in, of course, music, as I'm imagining what this guy could possibly be playing as he's zooming down the highway. It really was extraordinary. Uh, it was at exit, it was just after the uh, toll booths on, on the throughway down at, uh, down at exit 16. And, um, and, then, and then moving into you know, that ultimate historical event, <laughs> the apocalypse. Oh. <laughs> uh, Where's the next one I wanted to read? Here we go. I tend to, I tend to take a long time to write poems. And, and by that, I don't mean that, that the poems don't come quickly, although I sometimes work on them over periods of months or years. Uh, but, but an event might happen that, that imprints itself on my feelings or on my consciousness. And, and it might take a long time be before I decide what exactly to do with it. And uh, one of these is the, um, uh, the second uh, shuttle disaster, uh, the one, the one where, the, where, uh, where the shuttle blew up as it was, as it was descending back into, into the atmosphere. And uh, I fooled around with it. It, it. it seems grim to say fooled around. It seems callous. But, but, but I was playing around with, with the idea for a while. And uh, I got stuck on the idea that, uh, that the shuttle came down somewhere out west and didn't make it back to Florida. And there were all these states that it had skipped over. And I kept thinking about uh, skipping over states. And that, that got me thinking to, about the physical process known as sublimation which is when a, a solid goes directly to a gas. Dry ice is, is probably the most familiar example. But we see it in the winter all the time on a, on a warm day when, when we see the fog rising from snow. Okay, and that's how, so that's how I finally uh, began the poem. And I, and I started playing around with ideas of sublimation and the sublime and sublimation in the Freudian sense of, of uh, taking our, our inmost desires and transforming them to a higher purpose and wondering about what, what is this uh, force that drives us to seek space, to seek something that's, that's beyond ourselves. So this is called sublimated. Fog rising from fallen snow overleaps the liquid state. That's how I would like to die, raptured from gross solidity, 
a subject saved from predicate, the way a single contrail splits in seven in the barely blue of barely air, the shuttle crew evading intervening states. We aim so high because we're low, citizens of gravity, collating wreckage that can't soothe lovers of the grave. Low flags mark our sublimity, while higher reaches thrum our nerves, as if in the flaring scratch of a phosphorus perfumed match, some human element survives. I can stay serious for a little bit here. Uh, when we were going into Iraq, uh, this, this was, th that was one of the times that prompted me actually to, to write a good many poems. And uh, most of them were, were actually pretty terrible because they were just hammering home my, my particular political views a little too hard and they were just a little too screechy. Uh, but I hit on a formula formula. I hit, a, I hit on a strategy uh, for, for this poem uh, that was based on my personal anger at uh, uh, the Bush administration's uh, denial of uh, any images of, of coffins returning home with, with flags covering them. We were, as you know, we were not permitted to see those. It was supposed to be a popular war, and they did everything they could to make it uh, a popular war. So this is called Folding the Flag, and it begins rather playfully and then, and then goes somewhere from there, Folding the Flag. With a lover or friend, stretch it out waist height and parallel to the ground. Fold lengthwise so blue midnight and its strict constellation vanishes under pure white and blood red, a frisson along the stripes shot between you. Fold again, lengthwise, a lot like unmaking a bed in which no one is ever just sleeping. The stars should stay outside, as in the universe. From the stripy end, fold it up in small triangles, kissing when you meet. Tuck in the end, creating a cocked newspaper hat from whole cloth, a thing useful and comforting, a suddenly public wife, suddenly veiled, her gold ring shining like eternal life, like moist eyes, like the bright stars in her jaunty souvenir cap, the weight of their universe pressing into her lap. Let me try a couple of these photography poems on you from the middle section of the book. As I mentioned, uh, Several of these poems deal with, with this single photograph uh, that was taken of my wife when she was, she was a teenager. And, um, and this, is, this is one of those. It's a, it's a poem called Looking Out. And the, and the fiction here is that, um, is that the white border of the, of the photo becomes a window in which both of us can look in each direction. Okay, Looking Out. I open the box of shades these glossy leaves drained of life to guide your photo up, my monochrome Eurydice. From your white window frame, you study this living room, a teenaged scientist, evidence swirling before you, condensing into a new cosmos. In the past, you wonder at this bald head, the phenomenon of color, and just what power has plucked you from your underworld. Love doesn't occur to you. The future rides on your adolescent armor, your serious yet almost smirking stare, the silly ribbon struggling in your hair. Silvery emblem, uniquely positive document of your teenaged face, hardly art, hardly life, ghost with a gleam, shade in your 15th year. Forgive my averting my gaze in favor of your fleshly air and lowering you once more to your dark bed, your chaste dream of the fulfilled life you cannot know you haven't missed. And this is quite a different one, which, which does um, look back to early photography. It uh, talks about daguerreotypes in the beginning. And, and one thing that you probably know is that uh, one photographic tradition in, in the 19th century, there were there were traveling photographers who would who would go around uh, 
um, rural areas and, and take photos in people's homes. And, homes. and um, with the child mortality rate being what it was in the 19th century, a favorite subject of, of uh, a number of these photographs was uh, photographs of uh, recently dead children. Who would be who would be dressed? And you've probably there are actually uh, collections of these, perhaps in the library that uh, that that you can that you can check out. And they are very strange and, and very haunting. So that's where this starts. This is called this is the poem that's actually called In Camera. Eternal life via a hinged wood box, a silvered plate, a man drunk on the stink of visionary chemicals. Pneumonia, scarlet fever, a rheumatic heart, anything plucks off a child of nine, leaving a thick Victorian glaze on its eyes, a bruise where its skull's been passionately kissed, a body perfectly composed for worship on the settee. No nervous tick or blink to blur the work of the daguerreotypist, aiming forever to fix nature here in the parlor. Light's remains absorb us, Whatever reflects can illuminate the silver buried deep in a dark box, sun banging on metal, a slight to gong the spirit back to our world where artifacts, this corpse's dazzling image ferried to new life in the palm, can, after full immersion in poison, thrive in a wood frame, a cold child offered on a cold reflective plate. From your frame on the piano, you smile, father, as if you didn't know a grimmer image knocks in my mind's dark box, a grayer picture, your face grisai as old snow into which your headlong frame, like a filthy joke, a pratfall at a formal dinner, lurched prone and made a last impression. Neither gin nor formaldehyde, not even the polished hand-joined Oak Kaufman's casement window from which you cast your frozen last look could put the trick across, the bright illusion you were at rest or warm. Let me read one of the, one of the literary poems. By the way, uh, let me just add, add as a little footnote to, to that, that uh, the I think the assumption a lot of people make is, is, that, is that poets are always writing about their, their lives and about their families. My father is perfectly alive and happy and living in Florida, and, uh, I, and I, I sacrifice him all the time for my poetry. It's, uh, it's, I think it's the least he can do, right? This is, a, this is a poem that's an homage to, to a favorite poet of mine uh, named A.R. Ammons, who, who taught at Cornell for many years. And, uh, and he's a poet I enjoy because, uh, one, his work is generally very different from mine. Uh, it has a very natural feel of it. He's, he likes poems that keep spinning out of themselves continuously. And, and one of the delights of his work is that, is that you never know quite where it's going to go and quite what's going to get into it. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention about his, his work um, is that uh, his sentences often go on forever. And what he uses as his favorite punctuation to divide thoughts is, is the colon. Uh, punctuation mark. So I play with that in this poem. Uh, uh, Ammons died in 2001, so this, so this is a memorial poem for him. This is called The Breakdown. Coming from anywhere, your poems, they traveled anywhere. Rucksack on the back, hitching up dungarees, hitching a ride, sentencing down the road, letting their hair down, letting themselves tumble down scroll-like, and pushing their lines through all those colons, never flinching from all the nonsense we push through our colons, compost being our biodegradable identity, giving away the game, giving off heady perfumes, signaling, hey, all the crap we spin out of ourselves, oat cuisine for someone else, a fly, say, or bacteria, imagination just another enzyme, how the whole damned process of breaking down never breaks down, woe never ends, only that in the localist terms, we end, ending up broke down into spelling, and if we're lucky, intimations of some glory and some end that we use to distract us from that glory and that end. All one sentence. That's all one sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a there is a uh, there is a colon at a, at the key at a key point. 
<laughs> uh, let's see. Well, while we're on the subject of death, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about this, but you know. Uh, several of the poems in, in the, a number of the poems in the book uh, take place in, in Mexico where my, my stepdaughter and her husband were living for a year and, uh, and we went to visit them. In, um, in Mexico City, there's an extraordinary museum that's a, a former Carmelite convent and, uh, uh, and it is set up as, as the convent would have been back in the, in the 18th century. And uh, one of the amazing things about it is that it has a crypt uh, complete with the uh, inhabitants of the, uh, of, of the coffins who are, who are still there. So this is called Carmelite Convent, Mexico DF. Past portraits of sedate saints at desks like grade school principals, Past dormitory cells where nuns once whispered prayers to iron bells, then sank to wooden beers and slept, we descended to the crypt. This death-intoxicated land gives skeletons the final chuckle. They play in a mariachi band, hack a, lap hack a laptop, dance flamenco, sing a feather boa torch song, soar on bat wings, fish, go drinking. Death makes mirth in Mexico. The jawbones slacken in a laugh. The lively, eyeless sockets know nothing ends in an epitaph, for pleasure lies in getting stripped of everything. Then, in the crypt, the, the glass-topped coffins let us view the corpses of some denizens of a colonial century, some of abbots, some of nuns, others sporting finer dress, all whitened by the same distress. A person often mummifies in the capital's sapless climate, Though ancient gum sealed one nun's eyes, some woolen and some fleshly habit had worn away. Thus she gave us a peekaboo flash of naked pelvis. Others suffered harder wear, ribs poking out between the buttons, their boots sewn of the supplest leather for bourgeois metatarsal bones, each now clumsily damned to dangle from the slenderest, whitest ankle. We couldn't say they lay at rest because the mummied mouths stood open with this or that peculiar twist, as if their maiden glimpse of heaven contradicted what they'd heard. Every body looked appalled on death, or the death of an illusion. Though one skull, maybe once a lawyer, grinned with clean white satisfaction atop his once tight boiled wool collar, grown ample, the kid glove on his fist skinned back to bare a knuckled wrist. That's intended to be sort of strangely humorous, I guess. <laughs> ah, well, over, over at Union College, uh, I'm sure most of you know, there's, uh, there's a, a beautiful uh, federal period uh, chapel that also has a, a wonderful chamber music series, and maybe some of you attend that. And uh, go, going to, to concerts at that chapel, uh, you know, month after month, week after week, uh, I've, I've always been struck by the strange uh, conflict between the austerity of the architecture and the, the lush sounds that are coming from, you know, the Emerson Quartet or whoever is playing. Uh, and I've also been struck all the time, every time I'm there, I, I, I'm always reading the names on the uh, war memorial that's, that's behind the stage. The Union College uh, men who, uh, who were killed in the, in the Great War, World War I. And so those, those three elements come together in, in this poem. It's a, another, another bringing together of, of uh, art of various sorts and, uh, and history. Memorial Chapel. We've arrived expressly to be transported while we sit stock still in the college chapel's 1800 federal architecture, witnessing music. Schubert, Bach, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, week in, week out, making this room a spare, sparse paradise, a garden where sound waves loiter, rounded to crystal. Now, for instance, Beethoven's gross of fugue in B-flat major scrolls from the quartet's guts. While listening, I study again the names carved back of the players, marble-clad memorial to the Great War dead, the undergrads and alumni who got butchered, giving Europe democracy it didn't desire, 
and lie transported off overseas. The gross of fugue spreads thick deciduous layers, oral flavors, ash, ambrosia, in living ears unstopped with the earth, unlike the ears of Wesley D. Carker, Luther Hager, William W. Waitskill, Herbert Rankin, Talbot Carmichael, Alan Ashton, Kennedy Conklin, Walcott Calkins, Alwyn G. Levy, Howard Thorne, and dozens more stone deaf to the music, deafer than a post, than Beethoven, college guys now deafer than when they sat in boring lectures and dreamt that bloody high romance, imagined those French jeunes filles, but found nothing transporting them, no returning, even as cargo. Well, I think I'll read two more, and then, and then, uh, then we can talk, take questions, or, or you can go out into the, into the beautiful spring weather. Uh, the, uh, I, I was lucky enough to, to get a, a wonderful painting for the cover of the book. It's, it's by John Curran. Uh, it's, uh, the, of course, the cover never does a painting justice. It's about uh, uh, four feet by six feet. It's a, it's a large painting. It's a painting I fell in love with when uh, there was a uh, retrospective of Curran's work at the Whitney a few years ago. Uh, Curran has since become fairly controversial. If, if, you've, uh, if you saw the uh, profile on him in The New Yorker a couple months ago, uh, you know that uh, uh, his most recent paintings uh, involve a lot of pornographic imagery. He says that it's a phase he's going through. Uh, this one does not, but, there, but, but there's, something, there's something very erotic and, and luscious about, about the women who are sort of cartoonally uh, uh, presented on the, on, in, in the painting. It's a painting called Stamford After Brunch, but I call the poem uh, Three Women. And it begins as a kind of, a kind of you know, art critic rant about the painting, and then, it, and then it goes elsewhere. Three women. Everyone's head's too big. Everyone's neck's too long. Everyone's knees are a bit too sharp. In every way, the painters judge them wrong. The upholstered chair crowds the upholstered couch, so the woman at right appears to have one leg wedged between the furniture. Ouch. But she grins heedlessly, a rich rag, once a husband's shirt knotted round her head in a lusciously careless coiffure. A round dome palpably echoed by buttocks that project far past the frame to tender an insolent offer, eluding the eye, embraced by the imagination, the dirty imagination, the jittery thrill of this exercise in uncanny titillation. I adore the beautiful middle figure, blonde hair pulled tight and cascading around her stretched bronzino throat, her smile an emblem of occult delight. She tucks up her too scrawny right leg and I can discover her left leg and her right arm nowhere. Her face betrays a gleam from nowhere, stupidly brilliant. Her serene, downcast eyes almost distracting from how, reckless of nature, her amazing, realistic eyebrows rise an inch too high on her forehead's cool slate. The dark-haired woman at left laughs so hard she squints, her hand a claw, her upper teeth glinting in lamplight like a scalpel blade. Clutching little cigars, martini glasses chiming in a triad, they enjoy a cackle at the fruits of happiness. The room hums, homey with conspiracy, a rumbling hum, shuddering safety glass, scorching books, sparing dental evidence from blown up buses, holy sites, whole cities, resurrected picturesque as ruins in coffee table books, browsed by three women, hot as four gossip, cool as an after whisper, spinning, shearing, and casting us out to moan in an envy inevitable as winter. And I think I'll end with, with um, what is the last poem in the book. Uh, this is also set in Mexico City. And in the suburban area where my uh, stepdaughter and her husband were living, there's actually a small park that's uh, dedicated to poets. And I'd never seen a park to get dedicated to poets before. So of course, we went to visit it. And, uh, uh, and I, guess, I guess it's a sort of meditation on, on 
<laughs> just what do we think we're doing? <laughs> I mean, poets in particular, but probably all of us. Poets Park, Mexico, DF. And there's a U in the poem, that, that U is my wife. You and I risked our necks to get there, dodging the mad cars careening around it, merging from all angles, a condensing asteroid swarm. Our eyes, forced open, wept in the acrid air. Breathlessly, we landed on that island, green as imagination, nearly blind to traffic, though we heard the autos grumble. Throughout this miniature oasis, people strolled, played with their kids, lunched. One couple necked like no tomorrow near a less romantic memorial to a poet I'd never heard of. His bronze head, looking grotesquely severed, rested on an open concrete book, as if admonishing all poets, look on this life, this work, and think again. Would you choose loving under this lush green or locking yourself up in an attic room? The real polluted thing or some daydream? We walked arm in arm, head after bronze head would neither speak nor smile nor grudge a nod. Exhilaration? Gray contentment, anguish, who knew I had no syllable of Spanish. Emerging from the poet's sanctuary, the car stink stinging, our eyes again gone blurry, we found a fountain fashioned like a pen, its nib replenishing a pool, a fountain pen. I pose beside it in your photo, writing, writing forever with clear water. Thank you. That's how it feels sometimes that you're writing with water. <laughs> no. if, you, if you have questions, I'd, 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 enjoy, I'd enjoy taking them. Comments or excoriations. Or, yeah. Um, what is your uh, background and uh, way of life? In other words, <laughs> um, otherwise. I try to lead a good, clean, healthy life. I, I'm, uh, no, I, I grew up. Grew up. I grew up. Grew up in New York City, uh, in Queens. Uh, went to school in Philadelphia and Syracuse. Uh, did my graduate work at Syracuse. Uh, taught at uh, Lemoyne College in Syracuse for about five years. And uh, for the last 23 years, I've been I've been in Saratoga. I was an administrator at uh, Skidmore College for about 10 years. And since 1995, I've, I've taught part-time in, in the English department at Skidmore. So this is your hobby? This is my life. <laughs> this is not what I make money from, no. Uh, but uh, but this, is, this, is my, this is what I consider my serious work. And, and fortunately, I'm, I'm married to, to a woman who is happy to, uh, to let me do it while, while bringing in a lot less than she does. Yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, when and how did you discover you were Oh, good God. Uh, uh, well, I, I've always loved playing around with words. I, when I was uh, five, my father let me play around with his typewriter, and, uh, and I soon discovered that instead of just hitting letters at random, I learned to read a little, uh, rather early, and uh, I, I found that you could make words. And, and then uh, I started writing little poems in imitation of my favorite author at the time, who was Dr. Seuss. And, and, so, and so he's my earliest literary influence. And, uh, um, but I, I started getting serious about poetry in high school. I had a wonderful English teacher uh, named Hank Levy who, uh, uh, who taught a creative writing class, which I took. And then through, through college, I, I was quite serious about it. So I've been, I've been serious about this nonsense for, uh, uh, since, since I was really in my late teens. Yeah. And I have spent many, many years hitting my head against the wall and deciding that uh, you know, editors, most editors don't know what they're talking about. Right? <laughs> you have to develop a very thick skin, as, as those of you who are writers and who send things out for publication know. You have to develop a very thick skin and you have to develop uh, a strong faith in yourself that what you're doing is, is worth something. Jay, yeah. uh, um, when you send poems out, uh, your poems have been you know, in was it Agni, the Georgia Review, the Kenyan Review, the Progressive, the Southern Review. When you send a poem out, how how often um, how many do you send out before one's accepted? I guess <laughs> for every one that gets published, uh, I, mean, I think uh, my acceptance rate is is somewhere around one to two percent. So I mean, for every one that gets in, would you do you send out? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, no, no. For every one that gets accepted, I would say I'm probably sending out a hundred poems. 
uh, and we're not we're we're talking about the same poems going out to different locations again and again. You know, in in packets of four or five or six. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the ex the acceptance rate is is very low, uh, and uh, you really just yeah, you re you really just have to have have faith. I, well, let me think. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm trying to imagine the sheets of yellow paper that I still keep my records on. I haven't digitized all this, but, uh, and so there might be on a sheet, there might be 125 different poems listed, uh, and maybe, oh, maybe, maybe two or three, so maybe it's a little better. Maybe, maybe it's up to about three or four percent acceptance rate. Okay. Yeah? So persistence and faith in yourself. Right? It is, it is. It's persistence, faith in yourself, uh, you know, knowing that, uh, knowing that you've got something to offer and, and that, um, you know, editors are just are just not looking at it in the right way. <laughs> um, I, yeah. But I have a question. I'm still back on John Curran. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm wondering what exactly it is about about his work. I and mean, it sounds like it's a combination of the anecdotal and desire. Yeah, I think so. There's something about it that that's that's witty and sexy at the same time, and I think and I think that appeals to me. And and it's uh, I think it struck a sympathetic nerve with some of the things that I try to do in some of my work, uh, maybe not so much in the, in the poems that, that you've seen here. Uh, I have some more scurrilous work uh, in, uh, <laughs> in, in, in a book that's going to be coming out in a couple of years. But, uh, so, uh, you're, so you're somewhat sympathetic with his excesses? I th yeah, I think so, and I, and I like I like his excesses. Uh, I think I haven't now. I haven't seen his his uh, recent work in in person. I've only I've only heard. Have you seen it? Is it is it really it's upsetting? It's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult to be a woman. In, in I think I think that's a gender difference, perhaps. It might be. It might be. And and if I saw it in person, I may I may very well think differently. I've only read descriptions yeah. of it. It's you know. very, I think it's a different dynamic in person. Sure. Right. Yeah, that may well video. be. Yeah, I think there are many people that are hoping that he gets past that. And, uh, and, and there are also many people who, who uh, there's a big controversy about whether he's a good painter at all. Yes. And, and no quality is always part of this discussion. Right, right. So, so I think the subject matter has become a problem for him. And, and, uh, but, but of course, it also enables him to make almost seven figures per painting, right? It's, right. <laughs> it's riveting. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 his his technique. I, I think his technique is astonishing. And, and as a as a Renaissance, uh, uh, somebody who especially works on Northern Renaissance art, my wife my wife loves the fact that he's glazing and glazing and glazing. Sure. And he loves she loves the finish of it. There's a nice tension that goes on there that lets, pushes it a little too far. Can you please it. repeat the question so we know what's going on? Oh, the question. Oh, I'm I'm very sorry. The que the question was about John Curran's work and and what attracts me to it. Uh, so. Uh, so I hope you can put that together with what I, what I was saying in the answer. Uh, I'm so sorry about that. I, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the questions from now on. Yes? Have you heard of Judith B-I-O-R-S-T? I haven't seen any Judith of her work. Judith Bjorst? Any, any of her work a long time, yes. Yeah, um, I have heard of her. I know, I know that she's, uh, she, she's a poet whose books used to, that's right, they used to appear everywhere. They were uh, love poets, love poetry mostly? Life, humor. Right, poetry. right. Yeah, yeah. Did she die? I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't know anything about her. Uh, the question was about Judith Bjorst, who's uh, who's a who was a poet uh, who was, I think, quite popular in the seventies, maybe. Yeah. <coughs> Even later. Yeah. Yeah. No. Very entertaining. We better mm -hmm. Google her. A friend of mine had uh, written a book of poetry. Had a Vantage Press publish it. Would you suggest that to anybody, other than wasting a lot of money? In Oh, okay. So the, the so the question is about about what are often called vanity presses, like like uh, Vantage Press, and there there are actually lots of them now uh, because because of the uh, internet boom. Uh, there are lots of places that will uh, that will publish your book uh, as either an ebook or uh, as an on demand print book. In other words, somebody has to order it and then they print a copy because they just you know shoot it out of the computer. Would I recommend that? I don't know. I th I think it's uh, there have you know there's a, there's a history of self publication going back to the 19th century, the 18th century. Uh, you know, you think of uh, William Blake and you think of uh, you know Wordsworth and Coleridge, and they're all publishing their own stuff. Uh, Whitman, um, but uh, but I think it has a different with, with with the publishing industry so large. I think I think it has a. Uh, a kind of taint to it now that uh, I think it's very hard. I think to get considered seriously if you if you uh, uh, pay for somebody to to publish your book. 
if, if your aim is to be considered as a serious uh, writer. I mean, if what you have is, a, is, for example, a family memoir and you would like it, you know, and you're not that in, as interested in it, it being a bestseller as you are interested in having hard copies to share with members of your family, that might be a very good route um, because they handle all the production for you. But, uh, uh, but in general, if, you're, if your aim is, uh, I think, to be a serious writer, it's probably, probably to be stayed away from, I would guess. Yes? Uh, do you do any reviewing? I do, yes. Uh, I, I review a lot of poetry uh, and, and other books for a number of magazines like the Southern Review and Kenyon Review. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm the, uh, last year I became the uh, daily uh, ballet reviewer uh, for the Saratogian up in Saratoga. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a big ballet fan, have been for, for about 30, uh, 38 years. And, uh, and our, our very good reviewer, Mae Banner, uh, died a, a little over a year ago. And uh, so I was asked to step in and take over the ballet reviewing. So I, so I reviewed the ballet season uh, for the Saratogian. I, I, I don't do uh, other daily reviews. Daily reviewing is tough, I'll tell you, you know, to see something and, and then, then you have, you know, 10 hours to your deadline to, uh, to come up with uh, 550 words or something on it. And yeah. not offend anybody. Well, that, that's an interesting problem uh, because, yeah, we, because we are the hometown You're paper, the hometown. right? We're the host, right? We, there's been all the controversy about whether the ballet is going to stay there, right? Um, and... It just so happened that, that last year the season was so magnificent was that there was there was very little bad to say about anything. Uh, you know, there were a couple of ballets that I didn't like and I said so. But also, when you have 500 words, you know, why spend 200 of them slamming something when you can spend spend that time talking about what, uh, what was so good? And I faced the same problem reviewing poetry. Also, I was telling Joe before that. Uh, I tend to write longish essay reviews uh, that bring four or five books together uh, under a common theme. And if I'm looking at 20 or 25 books and I have to pick out four or five, why would I pick out one that I think is really terrible to slam when I can you know, promote, I mean, poetry is, is hard enough to promote in this country anyway. Uh, why would I do that instead of picking out the four or five that I really think are the best and, and talking about those? You know, I, I'm not the kind of reviewer who likes to use somebody as a whipping person, but uh, uh, but uh, I but I do give mixed reviews. You know, if I if I'll I'll take a book by an important poet and say, here's what works, here's what really doesn't work. So, yeah, I'll have to see what happens uh, this summer because I know because the the summer's program has some ballets that are that I think are not first rate. So 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 we'll see what happens with that. Do you have uh, favorites among? Contemporary poets like Charles Simic or Caroline Forche. Yeah, I, I, I do. Who's, who's on the top of your list? <laughs> uh, well, we, uh, I, I think well, I think Seamus Heaney is just a genius. I think he's I think he's a brilliant, brilliant poet, and and I feel sympathetic with him not because his poetry is like mine at all, but because I uh, because I share with him a delight in language, a delight in, in punning, and, and a delight in, in poetic form. Uh, form is much more obvious, I think, when he gets a reading than, than when I do. But uh, um, but uh, but but he's he's certainly a favorite. Uh, I think uh, I think Robert Pinsky's last book, his most recent book called Gulf Music, is absolutely super. I think he's made a new advance far beyond what he's done before. So that's a book I like very much. Uh, there are uh, really kind of wacky poets like August Kleinzoller, uh who whose poems are totally unexpected. They will, they will go almost anywhere. Um, and he's, he's very adventurous. I enjoy reading him. I recently met uh, uh, the poet uh, Denise Duhamel, who is likewise a wacky poet and, and worth looking at. These are poets whose work is very unlike what I do. Uh, and, and Denise will uh, make up poems out of found materials. For example, in her last book, she has a wonderful poem that is composed entirely out of badly translated subtitles from Hong Kong action movies. <laughs> you know? And it's, it's brilliant. It is, it, and, and at the same time, she also has a long, uh, almost epic poem. It's about 25 pages long. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not even sure if it's a poem, but it's very moving. And it's composed entirely from found materials that came to her emails and letters and meditations 
um, about 9/11, uh, and it's 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 just a terrific poem. So that's those are in her her last book, which is called Two and Two. I think. Yeah. So she, so she's somebody that I that I've become very interested in. Uh, who else? Uh, Henri Cole, I think is very very good. Uh, Andrew Hudgens is a, is a good friend of mine, so I should plug him. He's got a he's. Uh, he's become increasingly formal, but he's, he's a very, very interesting poet, um, and he's very funny. He's, he's one of the very few very funny poets, uh, funny serious poets who we are writing. He has a book coming out next year, which is inspired by those old Victorian books of, of uh, cautionary rhymes for children, and the book is called um, Shut Up, You're Fine, Wicked Rhymes for Wicked Children, or something like that. <laughs> Um, so he's somebody that, that, I, that I admire very much. Uh, well, Avon Boland, uh, her last book is called Domestic Violence. And it sounds creepy, but it's, it's about domestic violence, not in the, uh, the battered wife sense so much as it is about uh, her native country of Ireland, um, the domestic violence that's been going on there. And one of the interesting things about this book is that she talks about Ireland uh, not just in its traditional sense of being subjected to the, uh, to the British, but in the contemporary sense of violence that's being done to it by becoming a member of the EU, mm -hmm. and how Ireland is becoming homogenized, and Irishness is sort of disappearing in the larger uh, economic and cultural uh, imperatives of, uh, of yeah. modern Europe. Success will do that. Too. Exactly, yeah. And that's one of the woes of the book, that, uh, that Ireland's that's economic right. success is, is, the, is the death of its culture. Trust the Irish, they'll mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so domestic violence is, a, is, is I, I think, a first-rate book. Yeah. I haven't ca caught up with Robert Hass's new book yet, the one that just caught on the Pulitzer Prize, but. Uh, uh, but he's a poet that, that I think is very good and again very, very very different. Robert Hass, H A S S, uh, and he's a poet that uh, that I think is, is is very strong. Do you want to say we're going to be tonight in case anyone wants to come? Oh oh, oh. if you happen to live in Saratoga I'm, or nearby, I'm going to be reading at the uh, Saratoga County Arts Council tonight at uh, 7:30 uh, at the corner of uh, Congress Park. If, if anybody. An old library. Yep, the old library, right, if anybody would like to stop it's by. It's a nice so, performance area. It is, it is. It'll, well, it'll be in the gallery, so it'll be a little more intimate. It won't be yeah. in, the, in the big theater, right? It'll be fun. So. All right, Jay. Thank you. Thank you very much.